So, um, Dale, I should introduce. I'm so sorry, I don't have my. Um, I, I would introduce yourself. Um, but but um, I'm excited to find out Dale. For, for years, I have um, been calling him on the phone and um, seeing this person. So, thanks so much. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be called a provocateur away from the poker table. Some of you know that. So, what are the key findings from this report? Uh, I, I just had so much fun reading this report, um, and there was so much new, and yet so much old, or you know, familiar issues for those of us who have been doing these um, topics for a long time. Um, key finding, as media use goes up, as children age, educational content exposure goes down. So the good news is that by the time a child turns about somewhere between 10 and 12, They've spent uh, roughly two years of time, that a time frame that's equivalent to two years in school. So that's a big deal. That's a lot of opportunity for informal learning. But the downside is then that we have a huge missed opportunity with new media. Uh, I was just stunned to look at the slides Vicki put up. It says, overall, here's children's educational media use. How much mobile? Oh, three minutes a day. How much uh, video game? Well, oh, four or five minutes a day. So there's a fair amount, you know, almost an hour a day, of educational television use, really tiny amount of new media use. Stunning shortcomings. So let's stop and think about what do we know from TV that's applicable here? What lessons can we learn? Have we done a good job of using TV as an educational medium? Well, sitting in the lap of Sesame Street, as we are here today, it's easy to say yes. Uh, we are all here because Joan Gans Cooney and Jerry Lesser had a wildly successful idea and plan, and they created Sesame Street. And Sesame Street showed us that we know how to make great educational media. It's engaging, it's effective, so we know how to do this with television. And then at the same time, if you kind of look at the big picture of things, well, so how well have we done with television as an educational medium away from Sesame Street, beyond Sesame Street, sounds like a title for a book. But you know, <laughs> how well have, have we done? And the answer is, well, maybe not as well as we would have hoped, maybe not as well as we would have expected and so forth. Um, we know Sesame Street's very effective. There's research that documents it. We know that children who are heavy users of educational media do better in school and better in life on and on. We know that from research done by lots of people here. We know that from research done by their mentors um, who can't be here. Some of them have passed on and so forth. So we have really good evidence about the cost effectiveness and, and the, the powerful positive impact that we can have from educational media. To be successful with children's educational media, you have to have great content and you have to have some distribution channel. So what did Sesame Street teach us? Well, it taught us how to do great content. Do we have a Sesame Street channel? Well, uh, that's a digression. Now you know we don't. We have public broadcasting. Public broadcasting has been the primary vehicle over time. And what's happened, if you really stop and think about this from an arm's length perspective, what's happened politically is we have political debates about whether or not we should fund public broadcasting. We don't have political debates about whether or not we should fund children's educational programming. The two get intertwined, probably to the detriment of funding for children's educational programming. I mean, let's face it, when public broadcasting is under attack, when, you know, there's a threat to their funding, who do they trot out to defend them? You know the answer, <laughs> and it makes you nervous, right? I teased Vicky that I would show the, the video of Romney and Bigford. She said, oh, don't you do that. <laughs> So how, if I get back to my question, how effective have we been with educational television? And the answer is, according to the Federal Communications Commission in 1983, according to the United States Congress in 1990, we have marketplace failure. There weren't adequate economic incentives to drive 
the, the creation, production, distribution of good educational media. How did we get funding for Sesame Street? Well, it wasn't advertised or supported, and if it had been, it might have blocked. I don't know, but we didn't want to find out, and there were alternatives you know, that, that drove it nicely. So, the marketplace failure that's documented in educational TV, that led to the creation of the Children's Television Act that David Kleeman talked about. And that led to um, the great successful educational shows that everyone knows about. The Flintstones that teach uh, history, <laughs> the Jetsons that teach children about new technology, and my favorite that I haven't covered in the study of license renewal files, Yogi Bear, which is educational because it teaches kids to quote, not do stupid things or be ready to face the consequences. <laughs> so be careful, be careful with this idea that everything is educational because you know people will call your bluff on this. <laughs> Missed opportunity with children's educational program? Yeah, absolutely. But yet, yeah, what do the data say? Vicky's got data up here that say it's all educational TV. We've, we're in the face of a bigger missed opportunity with new media. And how are we going to fix it? What are we going to do? I, I don't have the answer. But if I have an inspiration for an answer, it comes from you know, your longtime colleague, uh, one of the key architects of Sesame Street for many, many years, um, the late Ed Palmer. So Ed Palmer wrote a book called um, The Crisis of Neglect, Television in America's <coughs> Children. In that, Ed documents with mountains of data the cost effectiveness of children's educational media. And he had the gem of a marvelous idea. And the marvelous idea is, what if we had the government invest a penny a day per child to support the production and distribution of children's educational media? A penny per day? What do we currently spend on education in this country? We spend Oh, it's some way, I, I can't give you the precise number, it's between $55 and $58 a day in school. So let's say it's $58.76 a day. What if we spent $58.77 a day? What if we spent a penny a day per child? And we devoted that, we had the federal government devote that money to children's educational media production and distribution. That would yield a total of about $250 million might put them on equal footing with the Gates Foundation. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm really glad to hear this news uh, from the Gates Foundation. But if we could do that, then we could have, hopefully, we could establish some new examples for the new media that could be tantamount to Sesame Street. Because you go back to Vicky's data and you look and you say, how do parents know that something's educational? They can't list the criteria. They don't want to list the criteria. It's like fuzzy logic, which has been applied at the Supreme Court to identify some other things they don't want to have all the criteria for. But they know it when they see it. Parents know Sesame Street is educational. They know it when they see it. And we could do that with new media, where you have some examples that people could point to to then wake the parents up. You say parents aren't attending to the types of content they're buying, well, if they had some really benchmark examples, then I think it's possible. So my question for the audience and you know, for everyone to discuss it would be, could this work? How would you do it? There is a precedent. There was a National Endowment for Children's Educational Television, but nobody can raise their hand and say they got funding from it here because it only existed for about one year from 1990 to 91, and they gave out about $500. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's a precedent. That happened because Senator Inouye was interested. And there's an opportunity right now. I know my time's up. But there's an opportunity because if you're a Washington policy wonk, you know the Congress is talking about rewriting the telecom act. And this would be a perfect vehicle to wrap into the Telecom Act. And I am confident. Yeah. Uh, yes, you know this very well. And uh, so the, uh, you know, the opportunity is there. There's going to be lots of potential allies. And so I'd encourage people to consider that. And if you want to read more about the idea, I think Michael has posted a little blog entry on his website that I've done. So thanks very much. <laughs>